I've heard it said um, many times at conferences, as different speakers get up and, and preach, they say very tragically and very, with a sad heart that our churches uh, today can do a huge percentage of what they do without the Holy Spirit's help at all. While may we never be that kind of a church. The Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Wow, am I so glad. You know, I think the Holy Spirit gets the short end of the stick. <laughs> we talk about God the Father, we talk about God the Son, Jesus Christ. We don't give the Holy Spirit enough credit, but wow, He is fully God, and He is here with us today. He empowers us and enables us and convicts us when we need it, uh, gifts us and calls us to glorify Him, glorify the Father. Wow, I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit, and He is certainly welcome here. He is welcome in my life. Um, have your way with me, uh, Holy Spirit. Anyway, today is Father's Day. You children, you wives, um, if you didn't know, uh, today is Father's Day. So today uh, we get to celebrate men, celebrate uh, fathers. And I'm a father. Uh, God has blessed me and Teresa with four children, Teresa and I, um, with four children. And so it is a joy and a, and a really a privilege and actually quite an honor to be called to be a father. Now, it's fun to be a father um, most of the time. <laughs> um, some of the times it's not quite so much fun. But yesterday I was in our garage and I was just tinkering around a little bit and Caleb was out playing. By the way, he's our three-year-old, if you don't know our children. But Caleb's out there walking around. He's playing and doing stuff. And he comes walking up to me and I'm kind of down on my knees doing something. And he just hugs me and he lays his head on me and he says, Dad, you're my hero just melted my heart. Caleb is often will come up to me or, or us, and he will come up and he will say, Daddy, me like you. I just love hearing him say that. I mean, I don't want him to like ever grow up. He's potty trained now, so now it's like good. He doesn't have to get any older. Isn't that precious? Isn't that amazing when your kids come up and do that? They jump up and sit on your lap and they hug you and all those great things. Those sorts of things motivate me to be nice. When he came up and laid his head and said, Daddy, you're my hero, I never want to chastise him again. That stuff motivates me to be nice. You know what I'm talking about. You hear me. Well, today I'm going to be speaking on a topic that's very heavy on my heart. It's very dear to my heart. I think it's something that is monumental, but this is not easy stuff. What I'm going to be speaking about today, what I'm going to be preaching on today is not easy Christianity. What I'm talking about today is not basic 101 stuff, okay? So if you're a new believer, just kind of sit back and try to take it in, but know that this, what I'm talking about today, comes with maturity. It comes with a life being a disciple over some time. And also, some of the things I'm going to say are going to sound kind of weird for a little bit. So I'm going to ask you, bear with me, okay? Hang in there with me because there is an end to this, and it does get better. But I'm going to say some stuff that's going to be kind of weird at first. You're going to say, what in the world is this guy talking about um, here today? But I'm talking about fatherhood. I'm talking about, um, about men being leaders in their families. Now, what I see today and, and what I have to live, unfortunately, sometimes today, um, is, is us men being nice when we aren't supposed to. Us being nice when that's not what our family or our wives actually truly need. Again, this isn't easy stuff. This isn't beginner um, basic stuff. But let me tell you, people, when men are nice, when they shouldn't be, that leads to huge problems. It leads to all sorts of decay and depravity and issues and problems in our families and all over the world. Wow, God didn't design us men to be nice. Okay, bear with me. God did not design us, create us, or call us to be nice. In fact, what I'm going to say here today is that being nice as a man to your family is disobedience to God. Not easy stuff. Not simple stuff. But here in this passage of Scripture that we're in today, I have an example of a man being nice when he should have been kind. I have an example here of a man being disobedient and brought all sorts of problems and all sorts of issues into his family and ultimately into our families and under this entire world. Here I have an example of a man being nice when he shouldn't have been. Genesis chapter 3. 
Now, Genesis is the beginning. And chapter 1 is the beginning of creation, when God spoke everything into existence. Chapter 2 is basically the creation of mankind. Now, chapter 3 is the creation or the beginning of sin and the fall of mankind. Genesis means in the beginning. Um, So this here is a very sad and tragic story, but it's a story that we all need to know. And by the way, when I mean story, I I do not mean a fairy tale story. I mean, this is an account of history that we need to know. Genesis chapter 1, or I'm sorry, chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. The passage says, Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did did God really say that you are, are... that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. No, You will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Then the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then their eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in at the time in the evening breeze, and they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then he asked, Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And then the man replied, The woman you gave to me, you gave to be with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate. So the Lord God asked the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, It was the serpent. He deceived me, and I ate. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, boy, do we come before you today understanding that you are God and we are not. And Father, I thank you for this passage of Scripture, for this account of history of the fall of mankind, and I pray that you will take your message today and you will preach it through me this morning boldly and clearly that we may understand what it truly means to follow you. Father, have your way with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what I'm talking about here today is that men need to stop being nice. Men need to stop being nice because it is disobedience and it leads to deception and destruction. Notice that um, I said this is not easy stuff. This is stuff that you won't hear very often today in this world. In fact, it goes against what most of the world is telling us. But let me tell you, brothers, men did not, God did not create us. He did not call us to be nice. God created us and called us to lead. To lead our families, sometimes that means difficult decisions. Sometimes that means standing up and saying no. God called men to lead our families by example. God didn't call us to be nice. Now let me explain. Let me go on and and continue here for just a moment. But men, imagine if your wife came to you and she wanted to go on a great long excursion of a shopping spree. And you knew that your bank account was running a little lean and you had some bills that were coming up, some big bills. Now, the nice thing to do would be for you to say, baby, you go right on ahead, just get whatever you want, have a great time. That'd be the nice thing to do. 
However, the kind thing would be to say, darling, I am so sorry, but right now is not the best time to do that. We've got some bills coming. Our our funds are running a little bit low. And so, you know what? I'm going to work extra hard and I will do whatever I can to provide for you. But right now is not the time. That would be the kind thing to do. Now, fathers, what about your children? What if your teenager comes up to you and says, you know what, what about, what about this? What if your teenage daughter comes up to you and says, you know what, I'm really in love with this boy, and I want to go spend the night with him at his, at his house. The nice thing would be to say, darling, if you think that sounds fun, you go right on ahead. That'd be nice. She would think so. But the kind thing would be to say, that's terrible. That, that's wrong. You know what, God created you for so much more than that. And to sit down and explain God and his glory and his ways, that would be the kind thing. What if your children came up to you and said, said, I think that beer really sounds good. All my friends are drinking it. Will you go buy me a case of beer? You know what? The nice thing would be to say, sure, whatever you want, I will do for you, and to go get it. You see where I'm going? But the kind thing would be to say no and explain how alcohol destroys families and it brings all sorts of problems into this world. You can insert whatever it is that your kids may be dealing with, what you may be dealing with, but you get the point. There is a radical difference between being nice and being kind. What I'm talking about here today, just imagine for a moment if Adam had been, instead of being nice, if he had been kind. Wow, what a difference. Guys, God didn't call us to be nice. God called us to lead. Being nice to our families leads to disobedience. It leads to to deception. It leads to destruction. Look in your Bibles with me at verse 6. In verse verse 6, it says, Then the, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. That part just kills me. That part utterly kills me because Adam was right there. See, the the serpent came up and he slithered into her life and he began to whisper and talk to her and deceive her and trick her and do all sorts of problems. And we know that, that the serpent, the snake, was inhabited by Satan. It was literally Satan speaking to the woman there in the garden and he tricked her and he fooled her into thinking that it would be cool to know the difference between good and evil, to be like God. And so she took the fruit and she ate it, but then she gave it to her husband who was there with her, and then he ate it too. That kills me. I wish that part wasn't in there because it would be a whole lot easier to be a man and to to, to understand God's creation and all that stuff. If she had just been deceived, we could joke and laugh that all the sin in the world is the woman's fault, but I can't say that because he was with her. Huge words in the the Bible. Look back a chapter. In chapter 2, down at verse 15 and 16. You'll see what I'm talking about here. Genesis 2, 15 and 16. Remember, this is the beginning, the creation of man. And it says in verse 15, the Lord God took the man and he placed him in the garden of Eden to work it and to watch over it. He was responsible for taking care of the garden and what happened in it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Boy, do I wish that that wasn't in there. The part that she gave it to him who was with her. And he ate it. That just, it kills me because Adam was right there. Wow, see, God gave Adam that command not to eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil before the woman ever was on the scene. God gave Adam that command. Him and him alone. He, God told him what to do in the garden before he ever even created the woman. See, God told the man, you're to lead. You're to watch over and protect your family and this garden. It's Adam's fault. Adam was the one that was disobedient. He was the one that wasn't standing up and protecting his wife. It's Adam's fault. It's it's men's fault. Wow. He was the one that was responsible. See, Adam was, was being nice to his wife. 
She wanted to talk to that serpent. And so Adam said, go right ahead. You go ahead and talk. He was right there with her and he allowed it to happen. Adam was nice to his wife and he said, if you want to talk to that snake, you go right on ahead and and you do it. Here is the example of a man being nice. He let her do what she wanted. And Adam's disobedience to God's laws and God's commands brought on deception and destruction like this world has never even could imagine. Adam's disobedience brought deception and destruction upon his family and upon all of us. Adam's disobedience brought sin and the fall of mankind. Look at verse 7. What happens? After they ate, she ate it, and then she gave it to him who was with her, and he ate it. And it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. When they ate the fruit, their eyes were opened, and they understood shame. Adam's disobedience... And allowing his wife to do whatever she wanted to do brought deception and destruction upon this earth. Broken families in every way. Sickness and death. Deception and destruction. Demoralization. Um, Yeah, demoralization, destruction, and darkness, sin, chaos, and and the collapse of everything that was good, failure, doubt, and bitterness, anger, and unforgiveness, shame, and ultimately separation came as a result of Adam being nice. God didn't create us to... um, to be nice to our families. God didn't create and call men to be nice to their families. God called us to stand up and lead them. You see, Adam's sin brought death and destruction and deception upon mankind, upon his family. Literally all hell broke loose because of Adam's disobedience. Everything, all the problems that we see and we face in this world and on this earth today are a result of Adam's disobedience before God. God told him, don't eat. Don't even touch it. Don't even look at it. Stay away from it. Adam's disobedience brought all kinds of problems on this earth. But even worse than that, even just read all of the death and calamity and chaos and destruction that that brought, even worse than that, it brought separation between mankind and God. Even worse than all that, it separated man from a holy and a perfect God. Wow, what an issue, what a problem. Look at verse 8. Look at what happens after their eyes are opened. They knew they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and they made loincloths. And it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Notice what happened when they ate that fruit. Their eyes were opened. They knew the difference between good and evil. Suddenly they, they, were, they were shameful. And when God came to walk with them, to speak with them, to have an open, close, intimate relationship with his creation, they ran and hid from him. See, when Adam and Eve ate that fruit and they sinned and they fell and they were broken and they spiritually died, suddenly when God came into their presence, all they wanted to do was go and hide from him. That's what disobedience and sin does to families. That's what disobedience and sin does to lives. Suddenly, they no longer want to be around God anymore. They want to run and hide. As tragic as this story is, that's the most tragic When they ate that fruit, their eyes were opened and they started shucking God. They started ditching God. They wanted to run and hide from Him and all kinds of other problems come and and ensue from that. Just imagine for a moment, guys. Imagine if Adam wasn't nice to his wife. Imagine if Adam was instead kind Instead of him being nice and saying, go ahead, baby, whatever you think best, go ahead and talk. And if you want to eat that fruit, you go right on ahead. Imagine if he had been kind to her and he said no. 
Imagine if he had said, no, you get away from that snake, you get away from that serpent, don't listen to him. God has commanded us not to even look at that fruit, let alone touch it or eat it. Imagine if Adam had been kind. The difference in the world. We're not called to be nice, guys. We're called to stand up and lead, even when it's hard. Even when that means saying no. Even when your little child won't lay their head on you and say, me like you right now, because there's such a huge difference between being nice and being kind. Guys, God called us to lead. God called men. He created men to be the shepherds of their families, to lead them spiritually, to care for their children. And sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that means saying no. Adam's disobedience, Adam being nice, brought deception and destruction. Let me contrast that, brothers and sisters, that obedience to God brings trust. Obedience to God brings the construction of a life, of a new life, of a perfect life, of a sinless life. Obedience to God brings trust and construction. Wow. Our Father, that's what He wants from us. He wants us to be obedient He created us to bring Him glory by obediently loving Him with all that we have and following Him. That's what God wants. Wow. Brothers, if you love the Father and if you listen to Him, if you obey Him and His commands and and the Holy Spirit speaking into your life and leading and guiding you, if you listen and love Him, it'll change your life and, and you will lead your family into a life of obedience, of trust, and the construction of new lives in a strong family, huh. loving and, and following, following God. That's what the Father wants, a radical change in our life and in this world. What a difference it is when we're obedient to God. What a difference it is when we love and follow Him. When we're obedient, it brings peace and trust and truth and life and healing, and faith, and hope, and love, and joy, and strength, and unity, and confidence, and forgiveness. And obedience brings salvation, and ultimately redemption. What a difference it is to to follow God, to obediently love Him (laughs) with all that we have. What a difference it is. I love uh, little Jack Russell Terrier dogs. You know what I'm talking about? The little turbocharged, you know, feisty ones that, that, that drink um, that little energy drink like all the time and they're just spunky and all full of life and energy. Little Jack Russell Terriers. I just love those dogs. They're little 15-pound dogs that think they weigh 150 pounds. They think they're the baddest little dudes that ever, ever were. And, and Jack Russells are just cool. Teresa and I used to have a couple and we raised some puppies and I used to hunt coons with them. And if you're interested, I'd love to tell you stories about what those dogs can do. Um, they are mean bad little little dudes. But the thing about Jack Russells is they're very, very dominant. They're very domineering. Jack Russells, even more than most every other kind of breed of dogs, definitely need a leader in their life. They so desperately need a leader that if you will not be their pack leader, they will gladly step up and do it. Now, if you own a Jack Russell, if you know anybody that does, and they're not the leader of their little dog, and that dog is instead the leader, he runs the whole house. He will run the show. He will command everything that goes on. And the people have lots of problems and issues with their little Jack Russells because they're not the leaders. When the little dog is the leader, everything is awry. It all goes wrong and people have big problems with them. However, if you will step up and you will be the leader of that little dog, then he will love you and respect you and follow you. And you can do all kinds of great, cool, wonderful things with those little dogs. But The point is you've got to lead them. You have to step up and be the boss, and they have to know it. If you do, they will love and follow you to the ends of the earth. They are very faithful and loyal. Guys, our families are exactly the same way. Our kids are exactly the same way. See, what, what the world says today um, is that, that, first of all, women, you guys need to be strong, and you need to lead, and you need all these equal rights and all these sorts of things when God didn't create it that way. He says, you need to be be strong. And man, he tells us that we need to back down and allow our women and the women in our lives and the women in the world to run things. I'm sorry, God didn't create it that way. It's not my words, it's his words. If you don't like it, take it up with him. It's his commands. But what about the kids? 
The world tells us just do whatever your kids want. Let them grow and experiment and, and have fun and whatever. Be their friend. Well, guess what, guys? Your kids don't need more friends. They have lots of friends. What they need is a father. What they need is a leader to stand up and to tell them right and wrong. Not be nice, but instead be kind to lead them and guide them. God created women as the weaker sex. Men are weak, but women are weaker. We are so dependent upon God for our leadership, and our wives, our families are dependent upon us to lead them. That's God's design. It's God's plan. That's the way God created it, and he's got a reason. He uses men to step up and be leaders in their families. It's far more than telling them right and wrong. It's teaching them to love God with all their heart. It's being a spiritual leader. It's being what, what they need in their life. It's being God's ambassador to your families. What a difference it is to be obedient, to love and, and follow God. Wow. The reality is God designed women and children to need us to complement us, to work together with us. But ultimately, the responsibility falls on us men to lead. What a joy it is <laughs> to obediently follow, follow God. The, the enemy, Satan, has won a huge victory in this world as he has brought on these lies that, that women need to be strong and stand up and that men need to back down. That's a lie from hell. And the problems that we see in this world are a result of it. It's not God's plan. It's not God's design. Not for you, not for me, not forever and ever, not for Adam and Eve. God didn't do that. God didn't design it that way. Adam's disobedience brought chaos and catastrophe. It brought, it brought deception and destruction upon his family and upon this world. But you know what? The great and wonderful thing is that it, the story didn't just end there. It didn't stop with the problems. God didn't leave it with Adam's disobedience and say, by the way, you're banned from the garden and you've got to go out and work for your food. And by the way, um, Eve, you're going to have greatly intensified pain as you give birth. God didn't just leave it that there was a penalty for the sin. God took care of it. God took care of it. The, the amazing superhero of scripture of the bible of god's word the superhero of creation and history and everything is god and the son jesus christ you see no matter how bad adam's fall and sin was no matter how bad his disobedience and all of the problems that that brought on to god loved his creation so much that he took care of it he helped us out he gave us a way out look at verse 21 with me this is so cool. Verse 21, it says, The Lord God made clothing out of skins for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. You see, God didn't just leave Adam and Eve in their sin and in their shame and in their nakedness. God took care of the problem. You see, when Adam sinned and he disobeyed God and they fell and they ate and all the things that happened, all that problem, that brought sin onto the earth. And we know very clearly that the wages of sin is death. Whenever we sin, something has to die to pay for it. Now imagine before this happened, creation. We don't know how long it was from the beginning, the literal six-day creation um, of, of all of the earth and of life and everything else. We don't know how long it was before this happened, but before this, there was no death. Before Adam's fall, before sin came onto the earth, there was no death. No animal had to die. Adam and Eve had all they wanted right there in the garden. Nothing died. But when sin came onto the earth, God had to kill something to pay for it. God had to take a life and spill blood to pay for the sin. And out of that animal's skins, he made clothing for Adam and Eve. This is such a picture of Jesus. This is such a picture of Jesus Christ and the salvation, the redemption that we have through him and through his blood, through his atoning work on the cross. This is just a glimpse and a picture at God's love for his creation in the work and what Jesus did on the cross as he laid down his perfect life for us that through him we might be saved, forgiven of our sins and experience eternal life. This is just a glimpse at God, not just liking us, but loving us. You see, God didn't just like his creation. He didn't just like us to the point that he said, y'all just do whatever you want, have your, have your way and have fun. But God loved us so much so that he was willing to kill something for us. 
And ultimately, he killed his own son to take care of you and I. It all happened because Adam disobeyed God. It all happened because the man wasn't strong and he was nice to his wife instead of being kind and protecting her and leading her. Guys, that's what we're here to do. That's what we're called to do. That's what we are created to do. One final challenge that I want to just ask each man, each man here today, I want you to just, as we leave here today, to think about this. As you go through your life each day this next week, I want you to stop and ponder this reality. But if your children, if your wife, if your neighbors followed exactly in your footsteps, if they did everything you do, if they think everything you think, and they said everything that you say, where would that lead them? Where would that take them? What kind of a spiritual life would they have if they did and said and thought everything that you do and say and think? Guys, what if we lived our lives like that? What if we lived our lives as such a godly example for everyone that is in our life that what we do and say and think would lead them directly to the cross and to Jesus Christ? What if we lived our lives, women, As the second leader in your family, what if we lived our lives in such a way that everybody that we encountered knew Jesus because of him guiding and leading us? Stop being nice and start being kind. Let's pray. Most great and hard for us to understand. But Father, I thank you for your word and the promises that are in it. I thank you that even in our disobedience, you saw fit to prove your love for us, that you were willing to kill something, even your own son, that we might be reconciled to you, redeemed and paid for and and brought back into a good working relationship with you. Father, how can we ever stop praising you for that? Father, I want to pray for each man that is here today that your word would guide and impact their lives, that we would understand what it truly means to lead our families even when it's hard. So Father, give us the strength to do that. Give us what we need to be able to live our lives as obedient followers of you. Father, thank you. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for Jesus. It's in Jesus' perfect name we pray. Amen. So now is the time of our service when you're going to have an opportunity to respond to something that the Holy Spirit that is filling this place might be speaking into your life. And that could take on lots and lots of forms, many different forms of conviction. But what I want to do is ask you to be obedient to whatever the Father may be speaking to you. That's what it's all about is being obedient. Obedient to whatever it is that he says. Now, if you are here this morning and you've got a wayward child, you realize that you have been nice far too long and you want to step up the game and be kind instead and lead your families and you'd like to pray about that, I invite you to come forward today. Kneel down at this altar and lift up your family. Maybe you're a wife that's here and you know that the man in your life has not been spiritually leading and you want to pray for him, I invite you to come forward and pray for him. We certainly, certainly need your prayers. But the most important thing, if you're here today and you realize that you have never accepted and received the gift of salvation, Jesus is atoning blood for your sins. You've never received him as Lord and Savior. That is the most important thing you ever will do in your life. So if you're here today and you have not yet been saved, been born again, I invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.